Now recording. Hi, Craig. How are you doing? Uh, just a second ago, you called him Greg. Uh, well, have we? Uh, did we fire Craig and replace him already? Is that what's going on? No, he just keeps changing his name tag, and I forget to, to fire him properly. Oh, well, I mean, you, you printed out the name tag. You probably just misspelled it. I didn't. I actually just have blank name tags, and I just have a pet Sharpie, and like, hey, fill this out with your name. Oh, well, okay, well, maybe he can't spell. All he knows how to do is use audio equipment. I mean, uh, somebody's got to do it. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm Grumpy Dungeon Master Jay. And I think I'm coming down with a wise cold Christopher. And this is a podcast about Dungeons and Dragons. Man, Yay! That, was, that was the second worst intro of all time. No, I think it's up there for the top. Yeah. No, no, you you definitely have the, the top one. Well, how do I have the worst intro? I don't know. I, I would have to go back and listen to all of the episodes. But at least on two or three other occasions, I have told you that that was the worst intro we've ever done. All right, I need all the viewers, all listeners, to go back out there and watch, re-listen to every single podcast episode we've ever done three times, and that will let us know. I mean, you got to tell us uh, which is the worst, and that will let us know which is the worst, and we'll make sure to never do that one again. Yeah, but even though you're only listening for the intro, you have to listen to the whole episode again. Yeah, the whole episode three times. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this this plan will work, right? <laughs> That's uh, that's how that's how that's how you get viewership. You 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 ask them to watch it a second time to make sure that you weren't wrong, and then they watch it to make sure that you were, and then um, you say intentionally wrong things to get them to comment on you. So that drives up the viewership for the algorithms and all the other stuff that I just never going to do because I think that's rubbish. I, I am not I, bound I to some algorithm. I think that's what everybody in the Dungeon Masters Resources group does. I even even though it's not really benefiting them, I think they just say wrong things so that they end up with 150 comments on what yeah, they said. Yeah, that, that is that is honestly exactly how um, you you drive viewership up. You need people to commenting and and liking and being angry emotes to people, and that is the trick of the trade. Like there was a guy who went through and did uh, overanalyzing Avatar, The Last Airbender. We were just yeah. talking about anime. That's like number three. It's list. a really good one, yeah. That one is um, up there. And he would intentionally say very obvious things, like, oh, I don't know what that means. Like, oh, I don't, I don't know what a Twinkie is. Let me know in the comments if you know what a Twinkie is. I think it's some kind of butterscotch candy. And then, like, that would comment, like, a thousand people would just comment, no, Twinkie's this. Derp. Have you ever and, seen the movie Die Hard? He loved Twinkies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were so intentionally obvious, but they would everyone would comment about it, and that tricked the algorithm to think that there was a bunch of viewership uh, on that video. Also, a ton of comments also drives up even higher. And you know, he's now got a very successful YouTube channel because of that tactic. You know, and I I don't know I just. Feels like I'm cheating the viewers out of like real data. So yeah, I, if I, I say anything wrong, content. if I say anything wrong, I legitimately think that I'm right when I say it. You know, so I say shit wrong all the time, but it's never to drive up viewership. It's just because I'm wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're dungeon masters. Like we can't really be wrong about a lot of things. We got to make really quick calls, and we got to stick to our guns with those calls. So. Being wrong about a bunch of topics, a bunch of, you know, thought, even a little bit of science, a little bit of, like, mathematics, we kind of have to be really good at that. That's just part of being a DM is knowing, knowing that little sphere of stuff. I mean, you're always going to have people who are very, like, oh, I know everything about everything. And they'll tell you that elephants can fly because of their ears and how big they are. And you get the, the guy from Cheers, whatever his name was. I'm not saying be that, but you do have to know a little bit about things, you know, or, or just at the very least, least, you have to be really good at bullshitting about knowing yeah. things or at least be able to interpret things that you see in movies and just say, Hey, I think it'd be like this from the movie, this, and yeah. that would be enough. You know, well, it's, as a dungeon master, you're, you, as you said, you have to make quick choices. Uh, you might not always know the proper rule or the proper answer. And, 
you have the op, you have the ability to adjust on the fly. If I make a ruling and I that ruling is later proved to be incorrect, I'm not backtracking, but I will make sure you know that I explain to all my players, hey, I made this ruling. This is the actual ruling. Going forward, we're using the actual rule. Uh, if I don't like the actual rule, I might tell my players, I don't like that rule. Going forward, I'm using the rule that I went with the first time. Yeah, as <laughs> long as you are consistent and your players yeah. know that. So I was playing Avengers League this this last this last week, and um, we were doing the Black Cabin in Frost Maiden. Mm-hmm. You know, I think one of the one of the one of the better designed encounters, definitely one of the most creative. I enjoyed that part. Yeah, one hundred percent stolen from <laughs> uh, uh, the thing. Oh but, yeah, yeah. Part it it leads you in that direction. But what was funny about it was is is that I had a player fall through the floor, and she failed so miserably to on her deck saves that I had to, I had to invoke a third for her. Like she fell far, she fell like at a, at a square far enough close to the edge of the ravine that I gave her an additional dexterity saving throw to try to catch herself after she failed to do not, you know, have a character fall in a ravine and die. Well, I, I kind of felt bad in a way because it's like she passed the first one fine. And then she just, oops, I didn't check for anything, and now I'm falling to my death. And I really didn't want her to be out of the, out of the, the entire game for the rest of the night, making up a new character, just because there's happened, no way yeah. they could resurrect them. They gave all their money to the freaking dragon, and now they can't do anything anymore. So they can't res themselves. They have no money, uh, per AL rules that is. Yeah. And <laughs> so I felt really bad. So I gave her that like. Third last grasp at the edge of the ravine, uh, and you know it's it's possible that you fail that one and fall to your death. Uh, it happened in the movie we both saw this weekend. Yeah, you know even the best, most athletic, most dexterous character can fall to their death. When, when you you're just, rolling dice, man, anything can happen. Um, yeah, the uh, dice tell part of the story. Yeah, I have a little bit of a story about that for later. <laughs> So like you could be amazing at it and still roll all once, and that's just how it, just how it goes sometimes. I was being a very gracious and forgiving DM and and letting another opportunity come, and uh, it doesn't really matter because they're about to fight a CR eight monster, two of them next 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 week, and they're just they're just gonna die. They're level they can't five. Live. Yeah, they're level f- six now. I made them six. Oh, well, they could be levels. They, they could be a CR8 monster. Two CR8 monsters. Uh, yeah, we'll have to see. It would depend on what those are. You tell me after the the podcast. Yeah. Uh, they're yeah. doomed. Two, two makes it a lot more challenging. Let's let's be honest about that. They are doomed. So I got. I didn't run this weekend. I got to play in uh, the other DM Johnny's game, and. We were basically doing an arena. So the, his setting, the gods in his setting, take active roles in the world. Um, we played through the campaign with the characters a few years ago, and upon completion at level 30, we became deities. So now we don't ever play those characters, he just uses them as the gods. Uh, my current character is a barbarian who is a follower of one of the previous, uh, of the previous barbarian character. Yeah, so that's that's my deity. So we end up on this island, and it turns out that it's a big party for all of the followers of Grimnar, which is the barbarian god. So my character is happy as shit. All uh, for a whole week, it's nothing but drinking and fighting and challenges. You know, barbarian life. And then finally, the gods themselves show up and host the final days of the festival, where they put people through an arena. So the first fight and it's all it's all arena battles of adventures that we did with those previous characters. So all the mm-hmm. things the gods fought through. So the first one is us just beating up a sh- bunch of fucking goblins, you know. Uh the second one I actually don't remember what the second one was. Uh, 
my ba- my brain's pretty bad about this stuff. The third fight, or third or fourth fight, we had to fight a polar worm. I'm not sure. I think it was a polar worm. Yeah, the, the giant-ass worms that blow up when you kill them. Okay. All right. So, the first round of combat, this thing pops up out of the ground and lets out a screech. And everybody who fails a wisdom save is stunned. Mm-hmm. Which literally took out four out of the five players. Neat. Yeah. Uh, finally, and every round, or when you take damage, you get another saving throw. So I sat there, and on this barbarian character, I fail. Next round, I fail. Oh, look at that. I failed again. I think combat <laughs> went on five or six rounds, and all I did was stand there until the fucking fight was over. <laughs> Which kind of sucks. Kind it, of sucks. It can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that was a challenge. That was a thing that we had done the time before with our other characters, and we had nearly all wiped to that thing because there were two of them. And when when they die, they blow up, and we weren't aware of that, so all of us got fucked up by it. So, uh, but anyway, the fifth round was the most heinous challenge of all. It is the only thing that had ever killed Grimnar when he was mortal. And as soon as the description comes up, my character, who has done nothing his whole life but read the tales of Grimnar, shrieks like a little girl and jumps in the arms of the druid. Because it's a fucking intellect devourer. Which, if you're familiar with the intellect devourer, they're like CR1. And we're all level 12 at this point. But all mm-hmm. I've done is hear stories of this thing. I've never seen one. I just know what it is. And that it killed Grimnar in like one round of combat. So <laughs> combat starts. The uh, uh, one of uh, the, I think it was the rogue went first, stabs at one time, battle over with. <laughs> That's like the last boss and yeah, in the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was effectively the last boss of the fucking tournament because it was the only thing that had ever killed the god who was hosting the tournament. Yeah, I mean it makes sense. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, so then a, a bonus round pops up. You know, it, it's like, all right, if you really want, you can try this challenge. Good luck. So naturally, we try the challenge. And it's a tear ask. And you guys won, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, our level 12 selves killed the fucking tear ask. No, we didn't win. <laughs> Why not? You can't because... say you can't, you can't do 700 damage per round. Uh, if it was third edition, we might could have won. <laughs> might could have won? Might could have. Because at that point, uh, you could have had a frenzied berserker who potentially could have done 500 damage in a round. No. No, there was no chance of us winning. It has like a fuck. I think it's uh, AC was 25 or 26. It's just, I was having to roll ridiculously high to even hit this thing. Yeah, but you, at level one, you can get like a 33 AC. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, we did manage to put it... T- uh, we turned it into a chicken. How long did that last? Uh, uh, well, the, the polymorph spell lasts for an hour. Was that enough to take a short rest? Mm, <laughs> not, not really, unless you're immediately arresting afterwards. No, see, <laughs> the only way that worked, because it's still got really good saves and all. So, the druid... Uh, there's one class of druid that can summon like 16 CR one quarter monsters, I think it is. So he mm-hmm. summoned up 16 pixies who all can cast polymorph. Yeah. So then all of them just cast polymorph on the goddamn thing. So it had to make 16 saving throws. Yeah, you, you're bound to lose one. Yeah. Well, well, it shouldn't have. The DM just forgot that it has, you know, legendary resist. As you do, I wouldn't. I wouldn't legendary resist that. Yeah, that that's that's the way I'm running with it. It just didn't resist it, so it gets polymorphed into a chicken. We're just trying to figure out what the fuck to do to this thing, and then finally the polymorph wears off. And then it just goes about you know, a few rounds, and it kills all of us. Yeah, uh, exactly. I wouldn't resist it. I, I just you have an hour. Yeah. What are you yeah. gonna do? Yeah, we How far leave. away from yeah. the terrace do you want to run? Because it will catch up with an around. <laughs> yeah, like we, you know, the, the height of the arena, I think, was like 50 feet. Uh, we got 120 feet of area to move in. Yeah, it's not like we're really running away from this thing. 
Uh, I mean, you could you could say, all right, guys, we're going to take a quick nap. Uh, once the polymorph goes off, lay down and close your eyes. Ready, go. Short rest, mid-combat. Yep. Yeah, we, we, we could have tried it. Wouldn't have worked. We could have tried it. I mean, it's a, that's up to the DM. An interesting thought, though, and this is something that crossed my mind, because initially we tried to slow it, we tried to hit it with, like, uh, Tasha's hideous laughter, things like that, who, it's not immune to this stuff. It will affect it. So if it goes into chick, if it gets polymorphed into a chicken, it has the mental stats of the chicken. So we should have tried to slow it and hit it with that stuff right before attacking it, bringing it out of chicken. Because I would, Im- I would imagine it would still have the slow on it and the Tasha's hideous laughter on it. Okay. What does a, what does a giraffe's laugh sound like? It probably rattles the arena. It is the most horrifying thing you could imagine. I truthfully, I wouldn't know. It, it probably sounds like Gilbert Godfrey laughing. <laughs> Rest in peace, Gilbert. Rest in peace. <laughs> it sounds the terrorist sounds like Iago. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like Iago. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's just a that's a horrible thought. The fact so, that it would sound like that. So, according to the PHB Rule One Eighty Six, it doesn't specify whether or not you're in combat or not. Uh, PHB page One Eighty Six says a short rest is a period of downtime at least one hour long, mm-hmm. during which a character does nothing more strenuous than eating, drinking, reading, and tending to wounds. So if you, per raw, I guess, um, cast Polymorph on a Terrask and it turned into a chicken and you immediately all, yes. at your next turn, sat down and said, I'm taking a short rest, you yep. would. You, you, 600 rounds would go by of nothing. Yes. You, you, technically, and I, like I already, I already knew this, technically you could do a short rest at that point. It's, uh, you would get out of combat. So as it reappears, if you went immediately into resting, then you would basically just roll initiative. No, a, I don't think com- rest. combat wouldn't end. It doesn't say anything about combat. You would just have 600 rounds of combat that did nothing happen. Well, I I guess that would be that would be the DM's discretion. Do you roll a new initiative or do you just pick up with the initiative you had? You couldn't ready any actions because the terrorists will break out of that, you know, at the at the hour, you know. So you couldn't ready an action, but you know, you would just get 600 rounds. The terrorists could just pop back in front of you and then just stand up on your next turn. (laughs) Yeah. And proceed to fight again or die again, whichever whichever's the case. Yeah, at level twelve, we were going to die no matter what. We all understood that. We accepted that. It was just to see how well can we do against this thing. Well, the Terrasque for fifth edition is much weaker than its previous variants. It's still way beyond the the power level of a bunch of level twelves. But did you tr- really try? Did you truly try? Oh yeah, yeah. We uh-huh. no. No, we, we we never gave up. Even when there was one person left standing, we were still mm-hmm. trying to kill it. Uh, in truth, I think we might have done 200 damage to it. It's just the AC is so high, it has... Uh, it didn't even use any legendary resist, but it also has magic resistance, and it reflects any uh, targeted spells back at its caster. Uh, only a magic missile. No, it's anything that makes an attack roll that's a spell. Oh, yeah, range attack roll spell, yeah. Magic yeah. missile, a line spell, or any spell that requires a range attack roll, yeah. Yeah, so disintegrate, nope, can't do that. Uh, most most uh, cantrips can't use those. Mm-hmm. Magic mm-hmm. missile, right out. I kind of like that as an ability, though, for monsters. Yeah. Like, you know, not every monster, obviously, but something that's heavily magic resistant, having the ability to reflect seems like a good thing. Oh, yeah. Crack cats, man. Almost murdered a party that I had because of their magic turning. (laughs) Yeah. Or like a mirror, a mirror golem. Yeah. It's very deadly. 
I don't know. I think you guys could have done it. You need to, try, you need to believe in your deity better. Uh, yeah, it, I'll believe harder. It's fine. I get to try it again next year. Next year? Yep, next year. Yeah, that was one of the things. Uh, so when we killed the Frostworm, and I never got to engage it in combat, my character was really fucking upset. Because one thing that he does is anytime he kills a new monster that uh, he's never killed before, he gets a tattoo of it. Mm -hmm. So one, Frostworms in that world are extinct. Because Grimnar, after he became a god, went and killed them all. So the only way I will ever get to fight one of these goddamn things is in that arena. So now I have to wait a whole nother year before I can get a tattoo of it. <laughs> um, that actually reminds me, I've been watching, I watched season two of The Witcher this weekend. Oh, okay. You finally, finally got around to it? I, I finally got around to it. Um, because um, I, I'm going to get booed for this, but I, I did not like the first season of The Witcher. I and it was and it wasn't like the characters. Henry Cavill was fantastic. The other actors were were good. Um, or good. <laughs> were good. Yeah. That's, so that that's that's part great, part good. Yeah, they're between great and good. Yeah. Um, I didn't think Jennifer looked like the the pictures from her from the video game. So that was just kind of weird. But again, I don't care. Yeah. That's I'm not gonna make or break a show on that. <laughs> Um, Lord, I would hope not. I mean, I've I've done. I mean, sometimes you, ex you, you we all sort of expect characters to look like they were originally in the comics or the game or whatever. I don't know. Henry Cavill looks like the freaking Witcher to me. Yeah, they yeah they did a real good job with with him. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it it's never going to break a show, in my opinion, if somebody doesn't look exactly like I expected them to. Now, no, can no. can they act, and is the show well written? That that'll that'll break a show if it's not the case. Season two, however, was much more what I expected Witcher one to be. All right, um, kind of like going around. It was a fighting whole bunch. Of, a lot of it was just one offs. Yeah, yeah, like going around fighting monsters. And I think the games. I haven't played any of the games, but my understanding is like you're <laughs> supposed to do research on the monsters before you go and fight them. So I know what a banshee is. You know what a banshee is. But in the Witcher world, what is a banshee? So like you could go and fight her, but you know get get rolled because you didn't have the proper like potion or spell or whatever prepared that you would normally need. Like all the weaknesses don't sh really show up. Yeah. Um. So that 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 part's interesting. So it's a it's kind of a, a twist on the normal fantasy world as it yeah, were like, like a, a lot of the things that you hear about aren't they're not all the same in, in the witcher world like I, I know the basilisks are a little different than uh they're just raptors from Jurassic world yeah kind of i mean they don't look like raptors they look more they look like, exactly like raptors they look like raptors and snake heads they had the feathers and everything and they went oh or whatever raptor makes. yeah but they they looked more serpentine they didn't have they they weren't like on two legs with tiny arms yeah, they actually were on two legs. I, I mean, I just saw. I just finished watching this earlier today. They're on two legs and tiny arms. I'm gonna take your word for it. I haven't seen it since the the week it came out, which was several months ago. Right. Uh, so I mean, it just it, it was very interesting, and I forgot what my point was. But anyways, yeah, it was, it was it was it was very good seeing how that all kind of melded together. Yeah, I, I am certainly no expert. When it comes to The Witcher, I've played maybe 30 hours or so of the third game. And like you were talking about, that you're expected to sort of do research and before you go fight them. And that's that's not how I play video games. I ignore all that. Wrong, I, just, I, I, I do. I, I play games like Final Fantasy when it comes to using potions and stuff. So in Witcher, you're expected to use potions to buff you up, to give you resistances to you know, certain types of monsters, to help you do more damage to certain types of monsters. I think I've used, I, I don't know if I ever used a potion in that game when I played it. I just went and beat the hell out of the monsters. Yeah, um, after the 35 hour mark is when he used to Yeah, it, 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 it may get a lot harder if I don't do it correctly later in the game, which I, if I haven't beaten it by this point, I probably never will. Uh, but I have the problem of Final Fantasy, where you get that Phoenix Down potion, and you're like, I'll, I'll get around to using that. Or that uh, elixir that gives you all your magic points and hit points back that you just sit on until the end of the game because you don't want to waste it because you never know when you're going to need it for a boss fight. 
Yeah, it's a mental disorder. And it, it, it may be. <laughs> no, it, it is. It's like being a hoarder of potions. Yeah. I don't. I don't do that in Dungeons and Dragons. I, I if you give me a fucking potion in that game, I'm using it. Probably sooner <laughs> than ne- probably sooner than necessary. Yeah, I like the guy. Like you walk into the. <laughs> You walk into the general store. I need to buy two heavy healing potions. Okay, here you go. All right, thanks. Pop, pop, drink, drink. I need these for later in emergency. Uh, uh, I'm I'm pretty good in that game about not wasting healing potions, but other potions I have a tendency to go through. Like I I we managed to come across a, a potion of storm giant strength not long ago, and I know I ended up using it in a fight where I really didn't need to. Yeah, it's a, it's a fucking legendary potion. If I recall correctly, it's a small goblin. Yeah, it wasn't, F that, it wasn't yeah. that. No, it wasn't that easy. Maybe I, I, I might. But yeah, like I would be likely to pour that potion and just rob a storekeep or something by flexing at them. You know, <laughs> I will break. Yeah, just walk up, grab like one of the swords and snap it in half. Give me your money. That reminds me of um, One Piece. Um, the swordsman Zoro in, in the show, the guy that has like the two katanas and then he has one in his mouth because being different, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what, why the guy thought of that as the, 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 the difference this swordsman was going to be from all the other ones. Um, and, uh, so he walks into a sword, into a shop and, he needs to buy a replacement katana because the one he had broke or turned to rust or something like that from the previous episode. And he's going through like the bargain bin swords because he has no money. And he pulls out like this one sword that's supposed to like intimidate you from never touching it. And so no one would ever buy it. That's why it's in the bargain bin. Oh. Um, and But he's strong enough or, or he has enough willpower to actually pick it up and, and, and wield it. And the guy's like, oh, don't touch that. That's actually a cursed sword from one of the 13 cursed swords of the, uh, in this world. And it will, it, will, it will kill you if you use it. it. It always cuts its user. And he's like, oh, well, if my will isn't stronger than the swords, I don't deserve to be a swordsman. He unsheaths it, throws it up in the air, holds out his arm, and the sword doesn't cut him on the way down. Um, and so he wields it for the rest of the series. So... <laughs> I kind you of can't, like. I, I you like can't that. will yourself through a sword curse. I I like. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it was a cursed sword though. It sounds like it was an intelligent weapon. They they, they all are. All all the cursed swords in One Piece are intelligent. Okay. I I don't know the first thing about One Piece yeah. other than it's a anime with a bunch of pirates or something. Uh, Which they're currently through. The, they're in the samurai arc, and they're all dressed as samurai, running around doing samurai stuff. Oh. Well, Which right. is funny because because Luffy, the, the the main hero, all he does is punch people. So he's punching people with the, with holding a katana. <laughs> oh, he just has a katana in the left hand and hitting with the right hand. <laughs> no, he's just punching with the right hand with a katana. Okay. He's not so he's using it punching. like a sword. <laughs> yeah, he's just hitting them while holding it. Okay, it's like <laughs> yeah. a it's like a roll of quarters that's unwieldy. <laughs> yeah, he picks up a new sword in, in that yeah. series, which basically drains your life force if you swing it. You do a massive attack, but then it drains all your life force. And he wills his he has a strong enough will that when he swung it, it started to drain his life force and he goes, No, and it goes bloop and gives it back. So that's if you want to intimidate your store owner <laughs> into getting a sword, that's how you do it. You find and a you, cursed sword yeah. and then use your willpower to get it for that, free. That that is a thing in uh in Dungeons and Dragons, though, and always has been. I was going to ask if you've ever utilized that intelligent weapons, where you, when you pick up the weapon, and you have to have a battle of wills against it to control um, it. No, but that's actually something that I've been struggling with with uh, the Dread of the Ice Devil too. Okay. All right. So I've kind of. I have I have I have a, 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 I have a problem I'm trying to solve and I have a couple different solutions to it and one of the solutions was an intelligent weapon. Um, so in Dread of the Ice Devil 2, um, if you played the first one, the Dread of the Ice Devil, you should have. You, and if you haven't, go play it now. Go go buy it and play it. It's on DM's Guild. Um, you you keep the you seal the 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 Dread General. Uh, in his icy tomb, 
and you stop the rituals that are supposed to basically free him. And so the story pre- progresses as you, the, 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 the NPC basically sends the heroes with a, a short, a portal fragment shard to Bryn Shandir to have a religious ritual done on it so they can scry on it and find out if there's any more of these portals or if the evil entity that made the portal is somewhere still on this plane or something along those lines, okay? So you do the ritual and you kind of basically see this vision of this huge battle happening in Icewind Dale pre the establishment of Ten Towns where an army of dwarves and orcs um, and some humans uh, fought back and an invasion of demons or, or an army of fiends, I'm sorry, um, from from invading Icewind Dale. And in the chaos, the Dread General w- was there and he lost his spear. Okay. Um, and the spear is part of what makes him so powerful. He's, he's a, he's a big, he's a big bad on his own, but the spear is even more so now ice devils normally can just like summon their spear out of existence, but you know, this one's special. This one has a, an, a mind of its own. So yeah. they built this fortress around the ice, uh, uh, the ice devil spear because they couldn't touch it without dying or and stuff like that. That's at least my, my thought process to this. And they basically, have a fortress guarding it. Well, the fortress was lost to time and lost to the snows of Icewind Dale, but through this ritual, you're able to find where this fortress is. The Duragar have mined their way into it, but they can't break the final lock on what seals the, the dread spear away. So you come along, you kill all the Duragar, get through all the traps and mayhem and, and cool encounters that I have set up. And there's like 15 you find the, the ritual to open the door. You do the ritual to open the door. And then there's the spear just floating there. Now, I've always wanted the campaign to end and had there be a third one. So I need the spear to end up with the bad guys. And so part of that was I was just going to have the big bad use, you know, like use subtle spell as like a source, like the source of subtle spell. And... Um, hit you with some kind of mind controlling spell to g- have you give him the spear so he can run away. Um, but there's a chance of that failing since everything has to be rolled. Yep. I don't want to ham fist it because that just feels bad, especially if I don't have the third adventure right here for you to play, you know? Um, but the other idea I thought was, is that the spear could just be sentient. And um, that's kind of what I've been going with recently is that the spear itself is sentient. And then like, you will most likely lose that battle of wills or the longer you hold it and touch it, the more cold damage happens to you and you can't run away with it essentially. And and holding it is going to kill you. But if you just give up the spear to the bad guy, he'll just take it and walk away. There's a lot of difficult points in that because if yeah, wanting to get it to the bad guy. All right. So it deals cold damage to you. The longer you hold it, boom, throw it in a bag of holding problem solved for the for the good guys there yeah uh, you know uh oh you have to do a test of wills against it well some players could win that you know anytime yeah. roles are involved there's no guarantees right i uh, yeah and i know you don't want to ham fist it but if you want it to if it has to end up in the bad guy's hands that's how you do it well it has to be that way we can have the third part <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you have to ham fist it. Unfortunately, you have to force the issue. Yeah, but that's where the idea of the sentient one comes in. It can resist going into the bag of holding. There's other weird. I can ham fist reasons X thing wouldn't work, but there's no way I could ham fist enough reasons as to why something wouldn't work. You know? Yeah, yeah. The only the only way you can guarantee it ends up with the bad guys is to do something that does not include rolls. Yeah, that's the, that's the only way to make certain. Yeah. And as a, I know as a DM, you never want to do that. But at the same time, you can also, because you're, it's the end of a module. You know, you can always just write the third module as if though it, it ended up with the bad guys. You yeah, know, I, but. But he's playing one, two, bad. and three. Somebody who plays one, two, and three, that wouldn't be necessarily cohesive. 
but it, you know you can do it that way. Yeah. So I'm thinking of approaching it from the the um it mind controls the player or causes you never to be able to touch it kind of thing. Like it doesn't want to be touched, you know, um, uh, unless you're aligned with, you know, the bad guys, right. Then you can't touch it. And I'm thinking that may be the best way to kind of go for it, you know, because if, the bad yeah. guy still shows up, you know, regardless to, if, if you are not evil alignment, you cannot wield this. You cannot hold this. You cannot touch this. Yeah. But then a bad, then just an evil alignment person holds well, onto it. Then, yeah. I mean, you don't allow evil alignment characters. That's you just put that at the beginning of the the thing. <laughs> yeah, but that's just you know, it. Just feels weird. So, like you know, that's what I've been kind of struggling with, and I haven't got a good answer. I've done a couple of things. I've written out a couple of different little scenarios, and I haven't been happy with any of them. And I did, and that's all. And unfortunately, like everything else is written and done. <laughs> like I have it all plotted out and formatted. I haven't been able to get through that last little. Mm, how how no. do I do this? How do I do this? And I'm just kind of waiting for an an answer to kind of like pump up in my head. In the meantime, I've started writing other modules and stuff like that, and kind of planning those things out. Um, the uh, I, I kind of ran the mod uh, my next module that I'm going to write in secret on my birthday, and uh, it turned out fantastic and. I'm looking forward to, to actually running that one. Good. Yeah, you mm-hmm. you'll tell me all about it after we're not on the. Uh, yeah, because you can't steal my ideas then. I'm not going to steal your ideas. I might for my own personal campaign, but you know good and damn well I'm never writing anything. I know all those people out there would take my idea and publish it before me. I can smell hey, it. Look, there are some people who might do stuff like that. Can smell it. I, can I know for a it. while we we could have sworn that Watsy was actually listening to our D and D games. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. They they kept releasing stuff right after uh, Dungeon Ma- like the other DM would run it. Like they would release it almost exactly or very very similar to what he had just got done running. It happened on a couple of different occasions. Well, I mean there there are there all there are always. Uh, uh, there are no uh, new ideas, is what it right, is. Right, there are there are no new ideas, but usually, when the collective group of creative individuals that exist in current popular media kind of get an idea, they all kind of get the same idea at the same time because everything kind of goes around the circle. Mm-hmm. Like when The Walking Dead came out, zombies were already like super popular at that point in time. For whatever reason, zombies were now popular again in the two thousands. Like, yeah, where'd that come from? And that kind of spurred other zombie stuff to kind of happen and come out. We had a fucking teenage rom-com zombie movie for Christ's sakes. Like, I mean, yeah, well, there the was world the, came to an end right then and there to me personally. They did the the rom-com zombie show. Uh, what was that one called? With the the girl who was a zombie who was a, worked <sighs> as a coroner. I everything about that. I just I, I zombie. Me. Yeah, I zombie. On a spiritual level, it makes me angry. Yeah, yeah, it, it it's referred to as jumping the shark. Like once you start getting romantic comedies based off of something, while there's a mass amount of it already out there, that that's when it's over with. Uh, we saw we saw it with the vampire craze. Fucking uh, Twilight just sort of ruined everything for that. And oh, I that ruined I, everything. I, yeah. I'm afraid we're going to get that for Dungeons and Dragons at some point, if we haven't already had it. It depends on how well the movie does, honestly, because that's when it comes out like the most popular popular cultures when a movie of it comes yes. out. Yeah. If you get one movie and it doesn't do much, then it's not a problem as far as jumping the shark. If you, if that movie does very well, then you get another movie. Then you get. TV shows. Once you start getting into the TV shows uh, of something of that nature, that's when things really go downhill or have the potential to. <laughs> yeah, because all of the Marvel stuff ha- has been pretty good, but superheroes in general have sort of played out, I think, at this point. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying all the Marvel stuff. I just saw Doctor Strange and the whatever of what was it, the Multiverse of Madness, I think was the name. 
the uh, uh, the multimedia of madness. Yeah, the multimedia of madness. Uh, really good movie. I quite enjoyed it, but at the same time, I'm like, man, it's another superhero thing. Just more and more of it. Uh, now you now you're starting to get sort of a lesser superheroes that aren't even necessarily tied to uh, Marvel or DC because there's the boys. They tried Jupiter's legacy. They did a cartoon spinoff from Jupiter's legacy. Uh, Daily wire released Hyperion, uh, the Hyperions. Like there's a ton of just superhero out there now. And I don't necessarily ever want dungeons and dragons to get to that. Uh, it probably will in the, in the distant future. Probably. Yeah, we had a, there. There was a a lot of fantasy stuff that came out throughout the two thousands. Yeah, because you had the Lord of the Rings movies come out, and then they did the Hobbit movies, uh, and lots of TV shows that weren't necessarily Hobbit based, but just fantasy based because of that. But I never. And then f- Amazon bought the rights Lord of the Rings and ruined it for everybody. Well, yeah, they're probably going to. I am not expecting much from from their versions of things. I'm sorry, but when the big the, the biggest executive concern was there's not enough tits in the film because it's not going to be able to compete with Game of Thrones. You've ruined Game of Thrones. I'm sorry, you've ruined I, Lord I of agree. the Rings. Yes, agreed. Uh, like, yeah. He, Game of Thrones was fantastic, but... Uh. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that Tolkien never bothered to write about how succulent some woman's tits were. For <laughs> three and a half agents. <laughs> <laughs> It was a commentary on World War II, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, Bezos, don't don't ruin this for us, man. Don't. He doesn't even know that he bought it. <laughs> you, he's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> what? I own Lord of the Rings? And since when? Oh, what, okay. well, no, no, Bezos is more likely to be, what is Lord of the Rings? Despite the fact that Amazon started as a book-selling company. But yeah, it, it, you know, here's just hoping that whenever that movie comes out, we, I would be good with a few extra things. I'm, uh, I like movies. I do like TV shows. I just don't want a massive glut to sort of, you know, ruin everything. I don't know. I'm just, I'm not, I'm kind of almost movied out at this point in time. Like there's just. There's too much Marvel stuff kind of coming out that's interesting and too much Star Wars stuff coming out that's interesting. Like my nerd brain has basically burned out from watching so would, much cool, amazing stuff. Yeah, there there's a lot of nerd. I we'll just lump it all together as nerd stuff because I, I truthfully I don't think there's enough Star Wars out at the moment. Well, I mean, Boba Fett just happened. Yeah, but I, at least with Marvel, it's movie, TV show, movie, TV show, movie, TV show. Yeah, the Star Wars you right now it's just it's just TV shows. There are no movies. There haven't been any movies for a few years, which is probably for the best. Give it a time. Give it a rest. But sorry, say that again. There are no. There haven't been any Star Wars movies for a few years. Okay, I, I guess you're right on that. Uh, what was the last one? Not was it Solo? No, the last one was. Yeah, it was uh, the third. It was the third one in the trilogy, and that. But that's been a couple years at least. It was right before the pandemic. Oh, that's, we did have the two-year pandemic skip, so... Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to forget about all of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> and I, I know we've gone off on a tangent about movies and stuff, but it, it, it all pertains to stuff we love. I, I don't know. I, I'm World building is, 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 is super hard to do. So when you have a world building thing that you're very proud of and, and you want to be a part of it, like Arcane and Witcher and all the stuff that I watched today, like hell, even Peaky Blinders is, is a show that I finished watching here mm-hmm. the last season. That was a, a fantastic show. Great world building, kind of like, you know, alternate 1920s um, booze gangsters kind of kind of thing. And they're coming out with a movie. So like I would be kind of I wouldn't be surprised if when that movie comes out and you see in the successful there's a bunch of 1920s films that kind of come out, you know? It'd be, yeah, where they're all like booze gangsters or, some, yeah. or mobsters of some sort. It happens I mean, all the time. Yeah. So I, it's definitely going to happen with, with D&D. 
I mean, if the movie's good, if but the movie's good, just within D and D though, like I, I don't think we get enough stuff from Watsy specifically because well, what is it? Four books a year. That's a lot. Uh, by comparison to previously when Watsy first bought it and when TSR owned it, that is nothing. Now, I know a lot of it is released on the DMs Guild. They expect a lot of it to go through there. But I don't I don't want to bitch too much about the, the you know releases and stuff. We've done that a lot on this podcast. I just always feel <laughs> like it's not enough. I want novels, goddammit. That's what's missing. Nobody reads anymore, man. Except for me. <laughs> Nobody reads anymore. Uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn about the whole situation and and stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of stuff that comes out. Wall fatigue is a big problem. Look at Magic: The Gathering. You know, there's, they just came out with a new set, and two weeks from now, freaking the next D and D set comes out. Yeah, no, no, you know Magic, how much a box Magic's of boosters is? Thing. Uh, yeah, buddy of mine. Four hundred dollars for what? The collector's booster box for the next D and D set. Four hundred dollars. Uh, my buddy just bought a booster of magic, a box of magic cards. It was one hundred and thirty bucks. So they're also going up in price. Not, not three hundred dollars more. <laughs> yeah, you're well, talking. Yeah, if you want the collector the stuff, stuff. Guess what? Don't buy that. You don't need it. No, that's 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 that the horrible thing is that the. They're now doing premium cards only in the collector sets and doing that. Yeah. So if you want to actually collect the cards, you need to buy those things, and which is just look. Let them, let them, <sighs> let them release all that shit. The people who want to play the game will buy the cheaper stuff to play the game. The people who want to get in the collector side of things because that side of the market is just out of whack, they're they're going to. You know, it's happening with baseball cards and other sports cards, too. It has been for the past couple of years. Something about the damn coronavirus. Maybe, maybe everybody who got the coronavirus also got a bug that makes them want to be collectors of shit they don't need. I, I don't know what it is, but everything went through the roof in the last two years. Fucking people are people are buying sealed VHS tapes and getting them uh, graded. Why? I don't know. I don't Jake, know. Tell me why. Tell me why that's happening right now. Uh, I don't know. But I, I guess because they think they can make money off of it. It, it makes no sense to me. Who the, Jay, why are people, they doing that? Most people don't even want VHS tapes. Yeah, you know, there's a <laughs> hand. There's a handful of them that are that actually were never put onto DVD or streaming, and I could understand trying to get those. But otherwise, there's no point. Jay, tell me why. Yeah, we should talk about the Neogi. Actually, no, let's talk about the miniatures. I'm just going to change subject. That's it. We're done changing yeah, subject. Uh, well, we're not talking about D&D anymore. Now we're just talking about the stupid-ass collector's market that's got both of us up in a huff. <laughs> well, speaking of collectible miniatures... Um, yeah. <laughs> see, that's how you segue... Uh, yeah. See, I was leading us there the entire time. Sorry, I'm bitching at the moment. So yeah, giant <laughs> miniature of a space hamster. Wait, no, a giant miniature of a giant space hamster is what I'm looking at. So they had uh, they released better pictures of the miniatures or like the, the like the 3D models they made, and so they have the giant miniature space hamster and you could watch the the trailer for the space spell jammer and kind of see the same things um at least some of the minis but some they of, have a, uh, most of these they they were not in that trailer yeah so the they they show the giant space hamster with like it's like halfling owner or whatever uh which is adorable and I love it i hope it's like a large miniature base <laughs> it needs to be a large miniature base yes yeah. uh, i love the fact that it's got like the little rope leash yeah, the next the next miniature they have is the Astro L, and we'll we'll put a link up to this on our on our website so you, you can look at all the figures. Yeah. We're not we're uh, not going to go through all of them by any means because they they list thirty of them, but there's a couple of them that really kind of stand out. We need to talk about. So they list an Astro Elf, which is the Space Elves, the Vulcans. It, it, and, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't and, see this Astral Elf without the, it. It reminds me of the Eldar. 
from well, Warhammer. Well, that's what it is. Like, it's just a fucking Eldar from Warhammer. Yes. Uh, but the funny part is, is this miniature doesn't have any features that you would not see from any kind of, like, longsword wielding miniature out there. <laughs> it just looks like a normal miniature. There's nothing that says elf on it at all. It's wearing a helmet. Yeah, the helmet, you have elf ears? the helmet is what makes me think it looks like an Eldar. Otherwise, it could be a human. It could, if, if I didn't see the size of it, I could be a half like, like you, you can't tell. It's the, the Astro Elf. Um, and then they have a Chewinga on a space guppy, which is adorable. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I seriously doubt I would ever use that, but it's kind of cool. You got to use the Chewingas, man. I, I don't like Chewingas, really. Well, I do, but I, I just am unlikely to use them. But I, I like the Space Guppy, though. <laughs> oh, they got a Hadozi fighter. And then here's their, your Neogi. So what is a Neogi? Uh, so the Neogi have long been a thing in Spelljammer. They're a spacefaring race that are a bunch of xenophobic slavers and plunderers, to quote the actual uh, Forgotten Realms wiki. And I, as I had never actually gotten to play Spelljammer, I've not properly encountered them, but I had always seen pictures of them and I had heard tales of them. And that's that's basically what they are. They are the bad guys of Spelljammer. They they run around, they plunder, they raid, uh, they kidnap people. And they look like a, uh, for anyone who can't see them, they basically look like a spider person. I mean, with yeah, a they, long, it's a it's a spider um, with it's an arachnid with six legs, uh, two claw clawed arms, and a long yeah. neck, a kind of like dragon like face, dragon like face, big yeah. furry butt. Yeah, the the furry abdomen, like spider abdomen, kind of damn creepy. Oh yeah, totally creepy. Um. The the Syrian rogue is a more cool monster to me. It's a big lanky lizard man kind of thing. Kind of looks like a um, uh, a pterodactyl, but without the wings. <laughs> it looks exactly like the dragon from Dark Sun. Well, a lot of, a lot of these spell miniatures are Dark Sun miniatures, which like the Thrycreen and stuff. Yeah, well, Thrycreen are in other places as well, but. No, I mean, obviously this is much smaller than the dragon, and if you're familiar with Dark Sun, Dark Sun has one dragon. And this this looks very similar to it. Long, just sort of elongated, humanoid, bipedal, uh, with a dragonoid head. Um, so what we what we really were interested about these miniatures is they showed off the ship scaled down miniatures that they had. So there's the Nautiloid, which is like the, the, the Mind Flayer ship, but it's scaled down to be like a medium or large size model, so you can play it on like on the on like a space map and have ship combat. Yeah. Which with being only sixty four pages in the stupid rule book, seventeen new races or whatever the crap number that they added, you know, I'm really worried about the details again that are gonna be in the Spelljammer release. I, I, like, I honestly, I expect them to just release a miniatures game. Yeah. No, that's happening in Dragonlance. We talked about that. Yeah, I know, but now I expect them to do the. Uh, they're going to do a ship to ship combat like X Wing, uh, just with a uh, yeah spell jammer at some point. So, so they have a Nautiloid ship. They have the Cosmic Core, which is like Cthulhu cross Nautiloid. I don't know. It, it looks, looks very Cthulhu esque, yeah. Not not Cthulhu himself, but like Cthulian. Yeah. Like Elder God of some sort. Right. Um a, and then a whole bunch of mouth tentacles and a bunch of spines coming off its back with one eye. <laughs> and then they showed off a bunch more like different stuff. The plasmoid looks kind of oh, cool. I like the plasmoid actually. I, I really want to play one of those guys. The space clown looks like the Joker from Batman Beyond. And then they have what I can only assume to be a the miniature space size version of an ancient gold dragon, um, a scaled down version of the astral dreadnought, and some kind of murder comet. There's the comet with a face on it. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, so I've never seen a murder comet. They actually call it the murder comet. 
Well, the murder comic. <laughs> and their their quote is, "Hail Bob has nothing on this bad boy." Uh huh. Uh, the one thing that we were kind of giggling about earlier, though, is the fact that the gelatinous cube is also on a raised base. And the only so other ones, like flying gelatinous cube. The only other ones that are on raised bases are the ships or ship-sized ones. So, is this a gelatinous cube that just floats through space and eats everything? Because that I would be amazing. So. I hope. I hope there's a planet-sized gelatinous cube that goes around all like Galactus, just eating everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be. Fucking awesome. Just sort of floats around out there and every once in a while it comes it doesn't even go for planets. It just anything that gets in its path just gets devoured. It's just just circling around space. Yep. Goes it'll through get, a star, it, the star gets destroyed. It'll it'll get caught up in the gravity of well of some planet somewhere or a moon and just eat it. No. Um, yeah. I I I'm very excited for Spelljammer, man, but I just, I have concerns. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I think, yeah, the, uh, I'm with you on the concerns. It is, and yeah, we've talked about it a couple times, so we'll make it brief, but it is a small book for a lot of rules. And here's hoping that they, uh, they do a good job with it. A nominal cosmic power, itty bitty living space. Yeah, we'll we'll try to remember to link the uh, miniatures because honestly, a lot of them are really cool. We only talked about a couple of them, but there's some really good looking ones in there. Yeah, that's the Solar Dragon, the the Mind Dragon, a Hammerhead ship, a Void Scaver. Um, well, the ships look really cool, and I think they're probably going to be the rare ones in the in the pulls. You know, ah, uh, some of them maybe, but some yeah. of them I think are going to be really common. The Nod Lloyd ship should be common. Uh, Gold Dragon, maybe not, but any of the the base race ships should probably just be easy to get a hold of. By the way, I really love the one that's called Major Warwick Blast Him Off, which is a <laughs> he, it's the GIF, the the G I F F uh, hippo person. He's got a uh, pipe in his mouth with a saber on his hip and the uh, blunderbuss in his hands. Yeah, it's a GIF. Yep, you said it right. I love how they did that. Uh, it's a hippo race. We're not going to tell you anything about them, but we're going to make a pun about GIF and JIF uh, because that's what the cool kids are talking about nowadays. Yeah, that war has been w- over with a long time. Everybody yeah. knows it's pronounced GIF. Yeah, even even the creator was wrong. Yep. Bye, Craig. <laughs> I'm southbound and down. All my rolls are crits. It's time for me to hit the bricks.